Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Chinese Music and the Culture at the Middle Tennessee State University. I know this is a virtual visit, but I really hope after today's session, it will be so interesting that you will finally decide after this pandemic to come to pay a visit to the center. Since we are uh, celebrating the Confucius Day, I think it's very appropriate from me for me to start with introducing this gigantic set of chime bells behind me and the stone chimes behind me. These are sort of a replica, but not directly, but the very, very close uh, of the set that was originally made in 433 BCE in modern day Hubei province uh, for a state called the Zeng. So this is for Zeng Hou Yi, Yi was the name of the, the king. So the instruments are bronze bells and each of these bells, it's you can different the size. The biggest is about 300 pounds and they all have tuned pitches and each of the bell tuned to two pitches. That shows that China back to 25 to 3000 years ago already perfected the cast bell technology and also the design for acoustics. So we will start giving you, uh, by giving you a sound of the bell. And I invited Randy Ringrush, a world-renowned organologist, ethnomusicologist, happened to be my husband. So very handy for him to come to work for me. <laughs> so we'll strike the bell and uh, also want to use this opportunity, this sound to bring good luck, happiness, and uh, uh, safety, health to everybody. Thank you, Randy. With that auspicious sound, we're going to move to a wall of musical instruments. China has a musical history goes back to at least 6,000 years. The earlier instruments that today we still can see and still can hear, such as this one, um, is a clay instrument that came from New Stone period. And clay instrument in the archeological findings in China from that period only had one hole, this top hole, which you blow into. But as time went by, two or three, five, seven. So this one has how many, Randy? This is a five hole. Traditionally, it's played on the top. However, these are not set holes, so you constantly have to adjust the pitch with your mouth. So it's not a perfect uh, instrument for that, but it's perfect for bending pitches. In about 2,500 years ago, China started to use uh, musical instrument categorization to uh, document instrument based on the materials they were made of. For instance, a clay instrument, the, the Xun is a clay instrument, it belongs to clay. The bronze bells is metal and uh, the stone chime is stone, of course. And there's another, instrument that is very old, which is under category of gourd. Right now you don't see gourd, but it is 
or the, it used to be a gourd instrument, right, Randy? Yes. Um, it used to be a gourd. Uh, the, the five pipe gourd instruments still exist uh, called Hulu Sheng. Uh, you can find them in southern China, Yunnan, Guizhou province, also in northern Thailand with the uh, Lisu and Lahu people. It's the same instrument. Yeah, so some, some audience there probably feel this sound is familiar. And probably in the West, there are several instruments you have seen that sounded like this, which is very true. In the 18th century, a French father uh, who came to China and who was very fascinated about Chinese instruments, and he brought a sheng to Europe. In early uh, 1800s, uh, harmonica, accordion, concertina, and the reed organ all were invented based upon the free reed principles that the sheng uses. Um, Randy, you want to take over uh, about the xiao, which is a bamboo instrument. Bamboo instruments uh, is one of the eight categorizations in, in the Chinese musical instruments uh, uh, world. So I heard, so this um, is a- This is a shell. This is actually, uh, these are an, an inblown instrument. So are also known as, if I get it to the right end up, and also known as a notch flute because there's a notch right there. Um, and they're a classical instrument, very common in China. Very quiet. And uh, this is also a bamboo instrument, but it is a pai xiao or pan pipe. You see this in uh, South American and Central American in many cultures, correct? Yes, also common in Romania. However, there are many old, uh, uh, old iconography in China showing the Pai Sha. Basically the same as any other pan flute. And also behind me, you see this long zither. One is uh, vertical and also this one is horizontal. And later in tonight's concert, I will be performing this instrument with a group of uh, uh, top, top musicians uh, from the Central Conservatory. And uh, I want to uh, mention that a lot of people uh, don't know that if an instrument that was invented in China and it was a Han culture, um, from the Han culture, this instrument only had one syllable. For instance, now we call zheng as gu zheng, but in the Chinese dictionary, Xu Shen's dictionary in the first century, this was only called a zheng. And the gu qin used to be called the qin, and the xiao, uh, zhong, qing, so every instrument only has one syllable. And that also gives us a boundary to divide what is indigenous to Chinese Han culture from what are brought to China through trade routes. And one of them is very famous Silk Road. Of course, Silk Road is not, was not one road. It was a whole bunch of routes that connect China with around of the world. And the most prominent one is this pipa, uh, tear-shaped uh, tear uh, four-string lute. Pipa was introduced to China probably from the beginning of the first century all the way to the fifth century from different routes like India, Persia, Arabic, they all have similar type of instruments. So we don't know exactly which one uh, was the ancestor of pipa, probably all of them. But between the fifth to uh, seventh century, which reached to the Chinese Tang Dynasty, then pipa started to change uh, from uh, used to be played 
uh, horizontally, if you see the Dunhuang uh, mural painting, they even played like backward, but then later it started to stand up playing vertically. And the pipa you see here is a t about 19, late 19th century, early 20th century version, and it started using uh, steel, steel string instead of old silk string. And based on that, there is a smaller one right behind me called the Liu Qin. That was originally a folk instrument from Shandong in 1950s because the Chinese started to adapt Western orchestral music and they wanted to have something really piercing as high pitch. So they used the Liu Qin from Liu Zixi to create this orchestral version of Liu Qin, which has a very high sound like mandolin. But also this one, which is called the San Xian. San Xian is a three string, if you, well, I just say it's a lute, uh, not necessarily, right, Randy? <laughs> no, technically it's in the Rabab family because of the skin, uh, skin on both sides. Yes. So uh, this is Python skin, fret, fretless. So you can slide your notes. Um, and these instruments are, are, are uh, quite a very large family, but coming uh, to China from the north. Right, exactly. And this one also came to China from the north, right? Correct? Uh, so that was Sanxian. This is called the Fili or Guanzi. This actually came from what is present day northern Iraq. Uh, this is known as the Fili or Guan. Um, and this is related to the Duduk family. So if there's a, a, any Chinese uh, audience in there hearing this, probably immediately thinking of a piece called the Jiang He Shui um, that was played on Guanzi. Jiang He Shui used to be called Jiang Er Shui. It's a Buddhist chanting piece. A lot of Chinese music that today we call traditional music that in fact came from Buddhist music as well. And also, we want to show you um, instruments just around a little bit. We have different drum. Um, the, so the big one is a war drum. And the small one here down in the middle is called the shugu uh, literature drum. This is a kind of drum you use to accompany uh, narrative singing. Uh, like Jing Yun Da Gu, Suzhou Ping Tan, in both North and the South would use that. And uh, also, you see a whole bunch of Hu Qin on the wall. These are two string fiddle. In China, this is, there is such a big family of um, uh, two string fiddle. Not only it's called Er Hu, Er means two, two string and Gao Hu from Cantonese music because it's a high pitched Ban Hu because the sound board is uh, used the wood board and also Jing Hu, the two string uh, fiddle that accompanies Beijing opera. Uh, so many, many different kinds. Also you see this, uh, this, this is a box zither, which is called Yang Qin. Uh, Yang Qin and uh, actually has a relative in our region in East Tennessee, which is hammer dulcimer and uh, American instrument. They came um, all from Europe, uh, from Europe uh, to China, from Europe to America. And we also have a number of lute I want to show you on this side of the wall. They are uh, Cantonese music, uh, in musical instruments. Both are called the qin qin but look quite differently. One looks like a banjo, another looks like a, a ukulele or you know, small version of guitar. So what I want to say here is that uh, you know, cultures are connected throughout history, even if uh, with the ocean um, separate the two continents, musical instruments travel. So now we're going to travel a little bit to another side of the, uh, uh, the gallery.
So this is um, a wall of um, Ch Chinese minority instruments. As you may know, that China has 55 different ethnic groups are considered a minority. Some of them actually have large populations. Um, so we would like to uh, start from uh, uh, from this side, from from yes, from the very end. So you will see a number of uh, Tibetan instruments. These are horns, but not necessarily considered musical instruments. These are religious objects that uh, play uh, sound to pray their god. Is this conch playable, Randy? Oh, wow. Yeah, please show, show the audience closely. Yeah, can you show them closely this is how uh, ornate this instrument is? And the, in the middle, it's a, it's a conch shell. So what's fascinating is in the uh, Himalaya, uh, the highest uh, um, plateau in the world, then you actually see, find a conch. <laughs> That's a sound. And besides that are a number of uh, instruments from a Mongolian culture, from Inner Mongolia. And the most typical one is this two string fiddle called the Ma Toqin or uh, Horan, Horan Hor. Oh, Moran <laughs> Hor. Yeah, what I was trying to say in Mongolian language, yeah, it's a it's a horse head fiddle. You know, as a nomad culture, horse is very important to a family. So usually, when a horse dies, the family uh, would uh, use the material, you know, part parts of the body of the the horse to make instrument. For instance, uh, the strings would uh, uh, be the uh, horse guts. And of course, the bowl has a uh, horse hair, and the sound box is covered by the uh, horse skin. So they will keep this instrument at home. And the sound of uh, the uh, Ma Tou Qin uh, horse fiddle is really, um, I would say this is probably the most hunting, huntingly beautiful musical instrument um, I consider. The technique of the Moran Hur or horse head fiddle is quite difficult. Uh, to play it, you need to use the small little piece of skin right above your fingernail to slide along the string. So you're playing, you're, you're fretting it with bent fingers, which is quite difficult. Uh, the bowing technique is quite beautiful. And uh, the Moran Hur used to be used sometimes to imitate the, the sound of a, of a mare, of a milking, of a mare uh, that, that still uh, was milking so uh, that they they uh, they could milk the mare to get um, to get milk to drink to make their their milk tea. Uh, they would imitate the sound of a small colt uh, that was wanting to nurse on the horse head fiddle, and that would get the mare to start producing. Yeah, and also um, on this platform, uh, you see a number of uh, instruments from Xinjiang. Uh, Uyghur instrument. Um, Randy, would you like to introduce that one? This is a dutar, um, called a dutar, and it's not in tune, uh, called the dutar because it only has two strings, du meaning two, tar uh, represents the strings. Yeah. These are quite long instruments and quite low in, in pitch. Um, but it's not really tuned right now. Yeah, and the back of the instrument is absolutely beautiful. And, and these hand drums, uh, known as daf, is quite common uh, in uh, uh, you know, from Persia to uh, Central Asia. Many, many cultures share this kind of drum. Uh, the, the Mongolian version is uh, or sorry, the Xinjiang version is off, often concerned, uh, called dap, dap or da. Uh, the difference between the, the Uyghur version and the Persian version is the number of string, uh, rings it has. Uh, the Uyghur version only has a single row of, of, string, of rings. Um, but that makes a shaking sound when you play it. 
playing it on the edge, you usually held in your hand like this. And And we um, just, uh, we will turn a little bit. You can see several different uh, uh, costumes from uh, Miao and Dong and uh, Yi. These are minorities from uh, uh, Guizhou and from Guangxi and Yunnan. So this, um, this bronze drum behind me has a history, goes back to 5,000 years. This is from Guangxi Zhuang and uh, called Tonggu. And bronze drum was directly related to agricultural uh, cycles. Uh, you see even today in Vietnam highlands, people would carry the drum and going up hills when they start farm. And um, what did you say? And what's interesting about this is that often uh, you'll have two people holding it on a stick, on the drum and the stick, and they hit it. And yet there's a, a person behind it with a bucket that puts the bucket into the, the inside of the gong and pulls it out, uh, therefore changing the, 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 uh, changing the sound a little bit, changing the color of the sound, and slightly changing the pitch. It's really quite interesting to watch. Right. And these two long drums are Xiang uh, Gu from uh, uh, Dai, from uh, uh, Yunnan province. And uh, let's move a little, a little bit. Um, well, you might want to mention that, that these, these Gu, these, these drums in the Dai culture, are not just played underneath the arm like this. They're actually swung over the head. That's and, right. And Dance. It's quite, uh, through the dances, and it's very acrobatic. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's uh, basically um, um, for, speaks for all the minorities in, the, uh, in the Western, uh, Southwestern China. Um, and um, uh, let's just first look at the, uh, the Dong corner. Uh, Dong is a minority in uh, East Guizhou. Dong culture is perhaps most well known uh, for their covered bridge, Feng Yu Qiao. So this picture behind me is um, is a typical Feng Yu Qiao. It's all covered bridge. In the United States, we have covered bridge as well, but not as uh, ornate, um, as beautiful as this one. And so is the costume. And men's and women's um, in the uh, traditional society, women especially, all their uh, belongings, all their valuables are carried or sold on their uh, clothes. These are silver. And it's two different kind of instruments. And this one is called a uh, biba or basically pipa. It's a small lute. And this was traditionally played by men. And men, after sundown, would uh, carry an instrument. A group of guys would go to a girl's house and start playing the instrument and singing the sounds outside, waiting for the door to be opened. So if the door opens, then they will go in, sit in the kitchen, surround the, the, the fire, and sing and play for the whole night long. And another instrument also for love songs is called the niu tui qin or gu gi. Uh, the reason it's called the niu tui qin is because the shape of the instrument looks like a cow leg. So it's a cow leg instrument. It's a bold instrument, hauntingly beautiful. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to play it because it's not in tune and I won't make it sound hauntingly beautiful. Right, right. Because these are instruments for exhibition. You know, I uh, uh, loosen all the strings so they don't get uh, uh, breaking down. But what is, in terms of the instruments, most well known from south southwestern China are wind instrument, lu sheng, hu lu sheng. These are instruments related to Chinese, han sheng, but same, same long history and diversity. So I'm going to let Randy introduce a number of these, uh, these sheng 
for Hulu Sheng. And depends on uh, where they come from, from uh, what ethnic group, and they, they have slightly construction, but the principle is the same. All use free read and use bamboo as pipe and would put the bamboo pipe in a chamber, then make sound. So you see the very large dong instruments here. Uh, these can get up to four or five meters sometimes. They're very, very tall instruments. Uh, these were fairly small ones. This one stands only uh, a little bit less than two meters. Um, and that was brought to us uh, when we were visiting uh, Southern China. And the man actually brought it uh, by bus uh, and hand carried these yeah. at, at two meters long. That's right. No case, n n uh, no wrapping, just holding three instruments, take a train. And, and so you see resonators on these. You see large bamboo resonators. Uh, they help to balance the sound of these instruments. Some of these instruments have them, some not. You see small versions on this Miao version. This is a Miaozu version of the same instrument. So they come, depending on the minority, uh, and the particular uh, region, they come in different sizes. Uh, these come in a whole set of different sizes. So you find small ones like this, which are very loud, very, very high. Bright. Yeah. Very bright. And then you find other ones uh, like this. This is a very common size for, for meow and some gong to play. These instruments are played, um, sometimes these are uh, telling epic stories. There's a language to these instruments uh, that actually recounts an epic story. However, they're also used for dancing. So you see uh, large dances, large processions with, with the uh, Lu Sheng in front of it uh, of various sizes. And the Dong villages, you see a whole Lu Sheng ensemble in the center of the village by the drum tower with uh, the rest of the village dancing around it. And it's quite spectacular. Uh, sometimes you'll see one or two musicians actually competing with this, uh, jumping, hopping. Uh, this instrument can represent the beak of a bird. So there's one dance where men will stand on one leg and twirl around on one leg, imitating the, 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 the um, actions of the bird. There's another which the instrument becomes like a sword. So the men are spinning, twirling, doing somersaults, all with this instrument. It's quite phenomenal. This is an instrument that actually has the same reeds inside. This has become a very popular instrument coming from Southern China, uh, known as a, a hulu se. The hulu is a gourd on top. Uh, this instrument, actually, I don't know if this one's gonna play very well. Oh, I'll try it. I'll try, um, yeah. Again, uh, this is our uh, display. <laughs> so these originally were a two pipe instrument, uh, a melody pipe and a drone. Uh, mm -hmm. The third pipe was there just for show. Uh, recently though, in the last uh, 20 years, they've actually put a drone in the, the second pipe. Now there are even versions that are very large, up to uh, a meter and a half long, and uh, instruments that are uh, with many, many more pipes. But they're very beautiful sound. You probably will recognize the sound. Let's see if the drone will come out on this. Um, there we go, I'll try that. So, there's another instrument which is very important in the region, in the south. Uh, well, actually many, many different peoples, many minority peoples play this instrument. This version is Miaozu. Um, uh, Yitsu also are fairly common. These are known as... Koxian. I wanted to her to say that properly. Koxian or Koxian. Or Koxian. Yeah. Uh, Koxian are jaw harps or juice harps. Uh, they have a little tiny reed that vibrates when you pluck it. 
Uh, there are single leaf versions, three leaf version, two leaf versions, three leaf versions like this one, up to a five leaf version of these. Um, these are instruments that, uh, that, that voice a hidden voice. The hidden voice is the voice of nature, the voice of the spirits uh, used by shamans or uh, people to be talking with the universe. Um, but also they're used by women to talk uh, about things they can't speak of in, in public. They may be talking about their, the, their husband gone off to some campaign in a war someplace and their emotions. Uh, they can be saying some other things that, that only other women know about because the language is, is woman specific, it's gender specific. So men are left out of this conversation and probably for good reason. Uh, they're a very beautiful instrument and they become very popular internationally now. And also jaw harp, um, I was told, is uh, uh, played between lovers, correct? Yes, and some minorities, uh, jaw harp are played um, between a young man and a young woman. Um, they might start with a hulu shung, a type of shung, the mouth organs, the five pipe mouth organs, and play at a distance to talk back and forth um, because young people of different sexes are not allowed to be close to each other. So the only way they, they can gain any kind of proximity is with holding a, a jaw harp in their hands. Yeah. And that way, and they find themselves not very good at it. So they don't make much sound at it. Uh, and to hear each other, they have to get very close to each other to be able to speak. Wow, I guess since you and I are husband and wife, we're sort of in love. <laughs> And we can play together, right? In fact, traditionally, they had two jaw harps, ones that were tuned in a fifth, which yeah. were for the young men and young women. Yeah, gong and the mu. Yeah. yeah, and then ones that were tuned in a fourth for old, or old people like us to rekindle that feeling of okay. romance. Okay, let's rekindle a little bit. Okay. <laughs> So um, we probably have a few minutes left. Um, if you have any question, uh, this would be a good time to ask. If not, I will take you uh, to see more instruments. <laughs> what would you like to do? I think we can see more instrument if that's, that's okay. Oh yeah, that's perfect. I have another room and it's a splendid display of percussion instruments. So before we leave this, this is uh, a wall for Qin music. Uh, Qin is one of the uh, high arts uh, in Chinese uh, Han culture, you know, uh, scholars in the old time, the Confucius scholars were required to learn the Qin and also to learn uh, to uh, write poetry and uh, play uh, Go chess and uh, also painting. So this is our room of percussion. I just lost the sound. I just lost the sound. That was a problem I didn't want to happen. That's why I'm telling you about the chords. Sound is still good. Don't worry. Can you hear me now? Not yet. Not yet. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Wonderful. Wonderful. So we got this 30 feet long dragon and with a lot of percussion. These drums are mostly from Chinese Han culture. Uh, uh, five set, which is called the Pai Gu, uh, Chime Gu, and also a whole, whole, whole bunch of symbols and all that. And uh, right in front of me, you can see a, a number of costumes 
these are costumes um, for Beijing Opera. Beijing Opera is one of the many opera traditions uh, in China. And this one is actually quite young, only about uh, uh, two, 250 years. Question? Everything is good. But no adjustment necessary. Mistake. And uh, the, uh, the, the, these costumes are very symbolic in many ways. For instance, the colors. The red color in Chinese culture represents happiness. Um, so this would be something, you know, for wedding. And uh, uh, the 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 uh, golden color is for royal families, for emperor. So for a common person, you wouldn't be uh, allowed to wear something in that color. And if you go closer, you look at the uh, the dragon. It's a dragon. There's a dragon pattern um, in the uh, on the uh, empress gown, and that dragon specifically has five paws. If a dragon has five paws, that's a dragon for the empress. So make sure next time you see a dragon, check out how many paws. It's five, five four, or three. And uh, these um, instruments are uh, typical Beijing opera instruments. Uh, the uh, the uh, two string jinghu and the jingarhu, these are considered the lead instrument, as well as this round shape, lung, moon shaped uh, uh, yue qing. And lots of percussions. Uh, right now they're all on the floor, pretty low, so you probably cannot see. And this one is called the ban gu. Ban is this clapper hanging and the gu is this round gu, flat gu. So this is played by one person and this person functions like a Western orchestral conductor. Yeah, so the, the uh, traditional orchestra would sit on the side of the stage and then uh, the percussionist will see what's going on on stage, how many uh, flips, and the gento, dang, 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 chang, zai, chang. So the whole uh, um, orchestra's whole ensemble would follow. And um, we had lots of students coming visit us before the pandemic. And so they just love to uh, make noise on these instruments. Yeah, so this is the uh, the paigu I was talking about. This is the five in the set. They're tuned um, as a yeah, melodic instrument. Yeah, go ahead. question here. Do music students in China learn about traditional and Western instruments both? Uh, yes and no, because in China most uh, kids learn one instrument. It's either a Chinese instrument or a Western instrument. Very few kids learn more than one instrument. Let me see if there's any other question. Uh, I love the deep sounding bell uh, harmonics. Thank you. Thank you. Helena, do we have any questions? Um, well, I have a personal question. Yeah, I feel really amazed by Wendy's like performance skills since he can perform every single instrument. Uh, I play a few, uh, but Randy plays uh, several hundreds. Several hundreds of instruments. <laughs> That's right. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, it's, but not at the same time. Well, he's working on that to work to work on playing them at the same time. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm trying to grow a few more hands. All I got is this. Yeah. So if you are interested in buying musical instruments, there are a number of stores in the US. Uh, it depends on what type of instrument. If you want to buy 
zheng or pipa, these plucked string instruments, there's a store called the Sound of China, based in LA. And if you want to buy arhu, there are a number of carriers. Um, if you're interested, send me email, I can send you contact. Any more questions? Maybe you can talk about what this thing. What thing? The, the dragon? Yes. Well, dragon, wow. Well, it, 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 I, I don't know where to start with. Yeah, this dragon was given to us by uh, uh, Memphis Confucius Institute um, as uh, their, uh, their institute uh, uh, was closed uh, recently. And uh, so they, uh, they gave us this dragon. It was made in Wuhan uh, by their uh, uh, sister university. And uh, dragon dance is so popular in, in many parts of China, not only in Guangdong, uh, uh, in, in Wuhan, or in, in, uh, in the north, uh, but they all have different styles. Mostly is uh, a group of community activity for exercise and for entertainment and then during the uh, spring festivals or and the, uh, the full moon festivals, people will come out and play together. Uh, this is really a fun group activity to have. So you can see on the floor, uh, well, it's hard to see. Yeah. I'll dry one out. Maybe we can talk about the small drum. Right. Um, which small drum you want to get? Oh, uh, these, um, yeah, there are many different small drums. Uh, in the, this one is, uh, you know, not a hua gu, but basically the same time. There is a hua gu diao, uh, da, di da, di da, di da, 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 very famous from uh, uh, Anhui province. It was uh, said that uh, uh, women would carry a little drum and uh, uh, bagging along the streets uh, after, uh, you know, uh, famine or a flood disasters. So it, it's a sad story behind it, but the tune itself became a long lasting Chinese uh, folk tune, very famous. Oh, and we got another question? Yeah. 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 Um, there, are there are several uh, dances based upon different animals. Yes, beside dragon, the most famous one is lion dance. Lion dance, um, uh, was probably created around the Qing Dynasty, and uh, they are very popular in big cities in North America, in uh, San Francisco, New York, and, and yeah. so these, uh, we actually have a, a drum uh, in the main room, that kind of drum is used to lead the two, uh, two lines, because they're supposed to be, you know, the man cannot see and all that, so in the middle, a guy will, will hold a drum. And I believe that culture uh, was, um, you know, I wouldn't say, I didn't know it where it was, uh, I don't know where it started, but it was very popular in Cantonese culture. And oh, we have a cloud gown. This is a, a small version of cloud gown. This is an instrument played in both Buddhist and Taoist ensembles, used as a melodic instrument and played with uh, sheng or guanzi, the instruments you just heard. Thank you, Randy. Fun. Thank you, Dr. Mayhan. Thank you, Randy. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And um, if anyone, oh, good if anyone is interested in uh, MTS yeah. Center, yeah. I think you can visit their website. I typed the website and their Facebook page on the chat box so anyone can follow them on the Facebook. Yes, we also have a YouTube channel. And every week, uh, I release uh, a short episode on introducing Chinese musical instruments. So uh, 
subscribe us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rehan. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, enjoy, Thank you. Your, enjoy your evening. A lot of uh, uh, very interesting uh, shows in this program. Yeah. And Thank at you. At 7 o'clock, we have another and at 8 o'clock, we have a concert, and Dr. Mayhan will also perform and join with us. So, see you later. Bye, everyone.